Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Ella Raines, Edmund O'Brien, and Vincent Price in The Web. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Of all forms of entertainment designed to hold an audience in rapt attention, none has ever surpassed the murder mystery in excitement, drama, and suspense. And tonight, we bring you one of the more thrilling mysteries to reach the screen this season, Universal International's current hit, The Web, with three of its original fine stars, Ella Raines, Edmund O'Brien, and Vincent Price. And with enchanting Ella Raines in the cast, you'll gather that tonight's play, in addition to its other spine-tingling ingredients, has more than a suspicion of romance. And speaking of romance, during the filming of the web, Ella Raines herself became a bride and settled down to happy married life, uh, uh, between pictures, that is. She assures me that when it comes to household management, a good supply of Lux Flakes is a wonderful help in washing fine fabrics and keeping tableware and silver sparkling clean. Well, I'm sure that many other young brides in our audience have discovered the same thing and thanked their lucky stars for Lux Flakes on the pantry shelf. Here's Act One of The Web, starring Ella Raines as Noel, Edmund O'Brien as Bob Regan, and Vincent Price as Andrew Colby. New York City. Two men, complete strangers to each other, are determined to see a certain Mr. Andrew Colby. One of them, elderly, haggard, has just stepped off a train in Grand Central Station. Father. Oh, Father. Are you, are you sure you're all right? I'm all right, Martha. You should have let me come up to meet you. To see me get out of prison? It's not a sight I'd want you to remember. You're free now, Father. That's all that matters. Where is Mr. Colby? He didn't come here. Did you expect him? Yes, yes, of course I did. Father, please, don't, don't upset yourself. Let's go home now. He should have been here. I must see him, Martha. I must see him. The other man, so intent on seeing Mr. Colby, is now in the offices of Colby Enterprises. Is there something I can do for you? Any number of things, but unfortunately, I'm here on business. I'd like to see Mr. Colby. What about? Well, he's been carrying on with my grandmother. I'd like to find out what his intentions are. I'm Mr. Colby's secretary. If you have any business with him, you have Don't to... Don't bother. I can announce myself. Mr. Colby's busy. You can't go in there. Don't blame your secretary, Mr. Colby. She did her best. I trust this is something urgent. My name's Robert Regan. I'm an attorney representing Emilio Canepa. As a result of your negligent driving, his push cart and load of bananas were damaged to the extent of $68.72. Oh, yes. Yes, I, I seem to recall You've ignored I... my letters, Mr. Colby, so try ignoring this. This piece of paper is a summons. Well, I assure you, Mr. Regan, it wasn't my intention to defraud your client... I turned your letters over to my attorneys, Porter and Griswold. Porter and Griswold? <laughs> they wouldn't take a bath unless it involved at least $100,000. I think you may have a point there. Anyway, I'll see that Mr. Kniepa gets a check and a letter congratulating him on his choice of attorney. Ah, thank you. Do you always uh, tend to these matters personally, Mr. Regan? I thought my client was getting pushed around, Mr. Colby. I didn't like that. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Regan. Well... I guess you saw Mr. Colby all right. Sorry if I got you into a jam. Oh, anything for the cause of justice. My name's Regan, Robert Regan. I'll uh, try to remember. Oh, you will excuse me, won't you? Mr. Colby's buzzing. Well, I'm in the phone book in case your push card ever gets pushed. It very rarely does. Goodbye, Mr. Regan. I'm sorry about the interruption, Andrew. Regan? Oh, he was a welcome relief. <laughs> what an intense young man. <laughs> you seem in a very happy mood. Well, I ought to be Noel Holcomb just phoned me. They've decided to back me 100%. Andrew, 
Andrew, that's wonderful. You can wire our Paris office. We'll be ready to leave here in two weeks. May I come in? Oh, Charles, please do. We've been waiting for you. Croner was on the train, all right. His daughter met him. Croner. Hmm. How does he look, Charles? Well, about the same. Thinner, a little bitter. Five years. It doesn't seem possible, does it? Noel, that Regan fellow, what did you think of him? Oh, I don't know. Brash, hot-headed. Fairly bright, I imagine. Have him come to see me tonight. Come to see you? Yes, at home. Say, nine o'clock. Oh, will you want me there? Naturally, no. Naturally. Come in, please, Mr. Regan. Mm. There's quite a display of hardware on your front door. Do you always... Good evening. Well, hello. Uh, you know, when I'm worth $40 million, I'm going to have a secretary who looks exactly like you. Oh, my tastes are fairly simple. $20 million would be quite enough. How's Emilio Canepa? Expecting a check. Uh, what's the idea of this interview? Ask Mr. Colby. Oh, I thought you were his personal secretary. He keeps a few secrets from me. I couldn't. Say, uh, what kind of a guy is he, anyway? Handsome, generous, warm-hearted, brilliant. Come in, Mr. Regan. Ah, it's a very attractive secretary you have there, Mr. Colby. Yes, I'm still young enough to notice that myself. Uh-huh. <laughs> You're wondering why I wanted to see you? Yes, yes, I am. Well, I was very much impressed with you this morning, Mr. Regan. I liked your loyalty to your client. Loyalty is a very rare quality to find these days. Well, you can buy it at any dog store in town. Unfortunately, that's about the only place. How would you like to work for me? Ooh, sounds fine. At considerably more money than I believe you're earning now. Sounds even better. But what have I got to do that Porter and Griswold can't do? Well, briefly, it's this. Up until five years ago, I had a business associate, a man named Leopold Kroner. He became financially entangled and stole nearly a million dollars worth of bonds belonging to our firm. He had counterfeit duplicates made of them, and then, using his position as an executive of the firm... He sold those counterfeit bonds. Clever boy. Not so clever. He was sent to prison for five years. He's just been released. But I'm afraid the long confinement, well, it seems to have unbalanced him seriously. How do you mean? Well, he seems to hold me responsible. He phoned me today, and he threatened my life. <laughs> you better call the cops. If necessary, I will. But I'm negotiating rather a large loan, and if certain prospective backers were to hear that my life had been threatened... Uh -huh, well, I see. On the other hand, if I were to engage a bright young man to be constantly at my side... Nobody would think a thing about it. Exactly. That is, ex nobody except me, and I'd think about it a lot, and I wouldn't like it. Why not? Because I'm a lawyer, not a bodyguard. It wouldn't be for long, Mr. Regan. I'll be leaving for Europe in two weeks. In two weeks, you'll make $5,000. I've heard of that kind of money. Well, then what do you say? If you think I'm going to turn it down, you're crazy. But then you act a little crazy anyway. Uh, uh, I'd feel better if you took this. Be careful, it's loaded. Well, it's as serious as all that. Yes, I'm afraid it is. Can you get a permit to carry a gun? Oh, I can try. I have a friend in the police department, Lieutenant D'Amico, homicide. Huh. Well, when do I start? After you've seen your friend. I could see him tomorrow. What about tomorrow night? Very well, tomorrow night. You'll come directly here and Charles will have a room ready for you. Charles? Charles Murdoch, the gentleman who met you at the door. Oh, oh, sure. Tomorrow night, then, Mr. Colby, you've you've got yourself a bodyguard at five thousand per body. What's bothering you tonight, Mr. Regan? Besides you, well, nothing really. I'd like to see the boss, though. I'm afraid he's still upstairs in his study. You keep. Long hours for a secretary. I'm, uh, well paid. Oh. Where have you been? Oh, just looking the place over and getting the pan scared off me. That guy Murdoch. <laughs> Does he always walk around in the dark? Oh, Charles. He was probably just checking up on you. You better tell him I've got a permit now for that gun. He ought to wear a taillight. What does he do apart from turning up unexpectedly? Oh, lots of things. He's been with Mr. Colby for years. Mm, nice, compact little group. Murdoch, you, and Colby... There are a lot of double meanings in that remark. Oh, no, no. I just like to keep things straight. Who belongs to who? Why should you care? Well, we're, we're all hired help together now. Maybe I have visions of asking you for a date sometime. With uh, what in mind? Mm, dancing, drink or two, 
Catch his catch can. Uh, thanks for warning me. I'll bring along my police whistle. Oh, that won't be necessary. My early years in reform school left a lasting impression. Problem child? Average. I'd set fire to my kid brother once in a while, but <laughs> who doesn't? Well, that's very encouraging. Ask me nicely for a date sometime. Regan! Regan, help! Regan! Colby! Clunger! No, don't be a fool! Regan! Look out, Regan. He's got a gun. You better take his gun, Mr. Gold. Yes. Get a yes. doctor, will you? No. No, wait. I didn't know my aim was so good. Well, he, he may just be pretending. I'd better... No. He's dead, Mr. Colby. I, I killed him. Who is he? Leopold Kroner. Cro... How did he get in here? I don't know. I'll call the police. Sorry I'm late, Domingo. I've been in with the district attorney. Yeah, I know. So he turns you both loose, huh? You and Colby. Why, does that surprise you? Oh, no, no, no. You killed a man in self-defense. Hey, did he give you your back, back your gun? Yeah, as a matter of fact, yes. Ah. I fixed it for you yesterday to get a permit for that gun, didn't I? I want to have my head examined. Huh. That would have looked great in there without a permit. I don't like what happened last night. Well, neither do I. Colby's in his study on the second floor of his house. He's going over some business papers. He looks up and sees Leopold Kroner. How did Kroner get in there? I don't know. I told you that. So did Colby. Kroner has a gun in his hand. He says he's going to kill Colby and then kill himself. He says Colby has ruined his life. Well? Nothing. I just like to hear myself talk. Mm. Colby throws the papers in Kroner's face and makes a grab for the gun. Kroner fires one shot that goes into the floor. Colby starts yelling for you. He's still struggling with Kroner when you walk in. Yes, I signed a statement to that effect, didn't I? Sure, sure you did. You said Kroner turned on you with a gun, but he was off balance, you guessed. And you were able to shoot first. Any news yet from Kroner's daughter? Well, you'd know that before I would. Maybe. Maybe I would. Colby said he wants to make some sort of provision for him. What's bothering you, D'Amico? You are. A guy takes a shot at your boss while you're downstairs romancing a dame. You're a great bodyguard, you are. Why didn't he come to us if he'd been threatened? He didn't want the publicity, I... All right, Regan. What was the payoff? Look. Look, are you going to hold me? No. But I've been looking over the Kroner record for five, five years ago. Guy counterfeits some barn, sells him for a million dollars, and then pleads guilty. But nobody ever finds the million dollars. He stashed it away someplace. Great, then what's he so sore about? Man with a million dollars isn't sore at anybody. What's that got to do with me? Everything's got to do with you. You killed him. In self-defense, he had a gun in his hand. He'd already fired once. Anybody can shove a gun into a dead man's hand. Kroner's fingerprints weren't the only ones on that gun. Colby picked it up after Kroner was dead. We told you that. Kroner gets out of prison one day and gets bumped off the next. And all the time, there's a million dollars in cash lying around loose someplace. It couldn't be that you got a line on that money, could it? Now, lay off, Tomiko. You know me better than that. I only know one thing. This case is a long ways from settled as far as I'm concerned. Remember that, Regan. Tomiko, you really think there's something phony? You heard me. I've made out the check for Regan, Andrew, here. Oh, thank you. No, well, I'm terribly sorry you had to be mixed up in all this. Maybe you'd like to go on to Paris ahead of me. No, I'll, I'll wait. But I hope it'll be soon. I'm beginning to... We're in here, Mr. Regan. Oh, come in, Bob. I haven't had a, much of a chance to really thank you for last night. Oh, forget it. I'd like to show my appreciation. Well, would a check for $20 million be asking too much? <laughs> yes. But here's the amount we agreed upon. Well... Another day, another $5,000. I'd take it if I were you. I intend to. Thanks. Bob, if you'd like to stay on with me, no, I... No, I'm afraid I just couldn't stand the strain. I can't get used to the idea of killing people. What's the matter, Bob? Did that police lieutenant say something? Nothing important. What's the matter with her? There's nothing the matter with me. Oh, I think Noel's a little depressed. That Kroner didn't get me first? Is that nice? You know, you and I were talking about a date. Let's make it for dinner tonight, huh? No, thanks. Ah, oh, come on. We're both in the dumps. We really shouldn't inflict our company on anyone but each other. Why don't you, know? Call me later on. I'll let you know then. Okay, I will. Oh, uh, Mr. Colby, here. My gun. 
I'm checking it in, Coach. It was a great fight, and I'm glad I won. Bob, I... I Meanwhile, you still owe my client Emilio Canipa $68.72. Noel, I'm... uh, I'm glad he suggested dinner tonight. Are you? Why? I just think you might enjoy it. Maybe I will, if I go. Well, you could cheer him up. Seriously, Noel, he denies it, of course, but that lieutenant must have said something to disturb him so deeply. And uh, you'd like to know what it was. I didn't say that. A few minutes ago, you were sorry because I was mixed up in all this. Noel, what's come over you? It isn't like you to suggest that I go out with someone else. Regan has done us a great service. It seems to me the least we could do for him. Of course. I'll dig up some light, bright table talk of my most alluring dress. Anything else? No. Nothing else. More coffee, no? Who would you rather dance? <laughs> Not much of a choice. Coffee. Well, I couldn't have been more surprised when Kobe let you out tonight. What do you mean by that? I mean, if I were in charge of you, I'd be a little more careful about how I passed you around. If there's uh, any passing around to be done, I, I do it myself. I saw the look you threw him this morning before he gave you the nod. I merely wanted to know if he had anything for me to do tonight. Uh-huh. That's what I mean. You see, I don't kid myself that the president of Colby Enterprises isn't a little competition. This is America. You, too, can be competition. How do you stand with Colby? Why? What does that matter? Well, maybe I've already made a few plans. (laughs) Well, if you have, they certainly don't include him. So why worry? Mm, I'm just naturally a worrier. How long have you worked for him? A little over six years. You must know him pretty well. I recognize him when I say him. Well, no more questions? Uh, What's the use? Tonight I sit making awkward passes at a beautiful girl. Last night I killed a man. Tomorrow I... You're not to blame for what happened. I'm to blame for getting in a spot like that. Who am I to be carrying a gun, playing around with people's lives? There was nothing else you could have done. Oh, I could have shot Croner in the shoulder, couldn't I, or in the leg. I could have kept my head and not have killed him. Is that what Lieutenant D'Amico said? Huh? What does that mean? Nothing. Only you seem so... Disturbed when you got back to the house. And after I tell you what D'Amico said, do you have to leave right away or can you stick around a while and report to Mr. Colby later? Let's go home. Quit kidding. Colby asked you to find out what happened down there. Did he? Well, as a matter of fact, I intend stopping by his house. Your friends, Porter and Griswold, are there. I may be typing all sorts of reports till morning. It's happened before. Go on. Look, I went out with you tonight because I wanted to. You're rude, but you're upset, so I'll forgive that. But if you want us really to know each other, why don't you stop acting like a schoolboy asking grown-up questions? I'm sorry. So am I. Now take me home. I'd ask you to come in, Bob, but Mr. Colby's probably still busy with the lawyers. Good night. Oh, wait a minute, Noah. I don't like to leave things like this. About tonight, I'm a warm-hearted, impulsive boy. Sometimes I say things I don't mean. You're forgiven. I, I'm not only warm-hearted, I'm, I'm shy. I need a lot of encouragement. To do what? Can I demonstrate? Kiss him good night, Noel, or I'll have him here for breakfast. You must wear rubber soles, Mr. Colby. The porter and Griswold left a half hour ago. It was such a nice night, I decided to take a walk. Did you tiptoe the whole way? Is there anything you want me for, Mr. Colby? No, no. Run on home if you'd like. But why don't you both come in for a while? It's still early. I'd be glad to. Well, what did you do tonight? Oh, not much. We sat around, threw a few rocks at each other. Well, aren't you coming in, Noel? <laughs> it suddenly dawns on me that my dangerous beauty depends upon eight hours of sleep. My car's right here. Good night. Good night, night no. no. You have a drink, Bob? Hmm? No. Um, no. Well, would you care to play some billiards? No, I don't think my aim's so good tonight. Well, how about a few hands of poker, then, at uh, showdown at a dollar a hand? <laughs> you must be interested in my $5,000. I'm interested in everybody's $5,000. <laughs> Sit down. I'll get the car. Lieutenant D'Amico doesn't settle so cheaply. He's interested in a million dollars. Oh? Kroner's million. He thinks I know where it's buried. Do you? Until last night, I had to save up to weigh myself. What else does... Well, what else does the lieutenant think? I don't know. I can guess. (laughs) 
He thinks a wealthy industrialist has somebody he's anxious to get rid of. He hires a not-too-bright, eager young man as a bodyguard. And he frames a situation where the bodyguard has to kill the guy in self-defense. And then? The industrialist is rid of the guy, he's in the clear, and the not-too-bright young man never tumbles. It's an interesting point, because even if our dumb boy should tumble, there's nothing in the world he can do about it. Why should he want to? Why shouldn't he? Well, the man is already dead. There isn't anything your young friend can do about that. The district attorney has exonerated him, so there's no danger there. But on the other hand, he may have made himself a powerful friend. But you forget, he's not very bright. He may feel some twinges of conscience. Why? There was no intent of murder on his part. Morally, he's as pure as the driven snow. That's true enough. Then deal the cards, Bob. Sure. Well, it's Lieutenant D'Amico's plot. Let him worry about it. Regan, I wish you'd change your mind and come to Paris with me. You'd like it. Maybe I would. Maybe I'd end up with as much dough as you have, huh? <laughs> hey, how good's a pair of kings? No good at all. I seem to have eights over fives. There must be some way of beating you. There are lots of ways, Regan. But not while I'm holding all the cards. In just a moment, our stars return in Act Two of The Web. Libby, what are you grinning about? <laughs> Remembering one of the funniest pictures I've seen recently. And what is that? Universal International's forthcoming Western. I was fortunate enough to be on the set when they were filming it. A Western that's funny? <laughs> yes. Well, that's something new, isn't it, Libby? Yes, definitely new and hilarious. It's called... The Wistful Widow of Wagon Gap. <laughs> and in it, Abbott and Costello do a comedy version of the old six-shooter western. Marjorie Maine is the Wistful Widow, with uh, seven children. <laughs> and she makes a strong play for Costello. But uh, she has a beautiful daughter, played by Audrey Young, who foils all her attempts at romance. Didn't Audrey Young start her career as a Broadway dancer? Mm-hmm. But she also shows a definite gift for comedy in The Wistful Widow of Wagon Gap. She dropped in on the set while I was watching Marjorie Maine do a very muddy barnyard scene. And then, well, Audrey proved that she's a mighty smart girl. I can believe that. Especially when I tell you she's a luck girl from way back. You see, we were both walking through the barnyard to chat with Marjorie Maine between takes when our nylons got spattered all over with muddy water. Oh. Oh, they looked terrible. But Audrey said, oh, goodness, Libby, I don't mind that. A dip in locks will fix them in no time. Well, of course, I cheered those sentiments. And she told me how she used to save her dancing stockings with Lux. She really raved, John, about the way Lux cut down the runs even in strenuous dancing routines. And she's so right, as you know, Libby. Our famous strain tests showed that stockings washed with Lux flakes last twice as long. Not only nylons, but every type of stockings. Silk, rayon, cotton. Yes. I wonder why any girl would risk strong soap or rub her stockings with a cake of soap. Oh, uh, there's another thing about Lux Flakes, too. Oh, I've forgotten something, Libby. Well, it's especially important these days. It's the way Lux saves the color of your stockings. And now, with the exciting new deep tones that you see in the stores, that's vital. Thanks, Libby. So, to keep stockings lovely, to make them last longer, it's smart to Lux them after each wearing. Here's William Keeley at the microphone. Act Two of The Web, starring Ella Raines as Noel, Edmund O'Brien as Bob Regan, and Vincent Price as Andrew Colby. It's 20 minutes later. Deeply engrossed in the events of the past two days, Regan has gone home to his apartment. He's just opened the door when someone steps up behind him. Shut the door, Mr. Regan. Your Krona's daughter. Yes. And I have a gun in my hand. How much hate does it take to kill a man, Mr. Regan? I, I didn't hate your father. I, I didn't even know him. And yet you murdered him. I had to shoot. You've got to believe that. Why? Why should I believe a hired gunman? You murdered my father because you were paid to do it. To you, he was just, just a new car you could buy when he stopped breathing. Your father wasn't himself. He, he tried to kill Colby. I never dreamed I could hate enough to want to kill. But I've reason enough to kill you now ten times, and I'll do it. Oh. I'm sorry. I, 
I didn't mean to hurt you, Miss Croner, but I, I had to get that gun from you. All right. You've got it. Why don't you kill me, too? You've got to listen to me. I, I, I was hired to protect Mr. Colby. Protect him? From what? My father wouldn't have hurt anyone. Miss Croner, when a man is out of his mind... He wasn't out of his mind. And he didn't threaten Colby. And he never owned a gun. How do you know? I knew my father. He was the kindest man who ever lived. But he did break into Colby's house. He didn't break in. He was invited. Huh? Invited? He was asked to be there at 10 o'clock. I was there when he phoned. As if you didn't know. You're sure of this? Do you have any proof? <laughs> if I had any proof, do you think I'd be here now? Or that you would? No, Mr. Regan. If I could prove what I know, you and Colby would be where you belong. In prison. <laughs> You mind if I sit down, D'Amico? Or do you want to eat alone? Yeah, what do you want, Regan? I just called police headquarters. They said I'd probably find you here. You know, you were absolutely right about people carrying guns. Here. Yeah, where'd you get this one? From a girl named Crona. When last seen, she was in my apartment trying to kill me. You asking for protection? Uh-uh. I'm asking for information. D'Amico, how near are you to pinning Crona's death on me? i let you know when the time arrives. Suppose I told you that I agree with you, that I think it was murder. I've got a pen if you want to sign a confession. Not D'Amico, look. Everything I told you was the truth. Then what are you worried about? Well, it's finally occurred to me that I, I might have been a patsy in all this, framed. What's got you so scared? Does Croner Dame know something? I just want to work with you on this case. I, I'm on the inside and I might be able to dig something up. Sure, and cover it right up again. You seem to forget you're the one I'm after. You killed Cronin. If it's murder, you did it. What was my motive? That $5,000 you deposited in the bank today. In other words, I better get out of town. You wouldn't get three feet out of town. If I were you, I'd go to church every day and pray that a certain dumb cop named D'Amico was running himself right up a blind alley. Well, that's great, except I like to sleep at night. And I just talked to the daughter of the man I killed. Oh, you're in a tough spot. D'Amico, isn't there some way we can get together on this? Certainly. You confess and I'll arrest you. Okay, D'Amico. Regan, for a lawyer, you're not very smart. If you can prove that it's murder, you prove that you're a murderer. If it's a frame, there's only one guy can clear you. Colby. And I don't think he'd be too anxious to run to the rescue, do you? Thanks for nothing, D'Amico. Anytime, Regan. Anytime at all. Hello. Oh, good morning, Bob. I don't know how I could. I'll be busy all day. You what? Oh, uh-huh. Well, this afternoon, then? Three o'clock. No, you better not. I'll, um, meet you downstairs in front of the building. I'll be there at three o'clock. Now, isn't this better than working? A happy little drive through Central Park. You said it was important. When I feel like seeing you, it's very important. Why are you uh, stopping here? Oh, this is the best little parking spot in town. I used to operate from here all the time when I was in high school, except I'd hit it a lot later in the evening. Uh-huh. That must have been a progressive school you went to. Oh, it was. What did you want to see me about? Well, made up my mind about a lot of things last night, Noel. For one thing... I'm not going to Paris with Colby. And I don't want you to go either. Really? What do you want me to do? See America first. You might get to meet someone you'd like. I might. With Colby, what have you got? Money, influence, travel, yachts? Why don't you let me take you out of all that? That's an offer if I've ever heard one. No. I'm really very serious. I know you are. Bob, well, what's the matter? I spent the whole morning in a newspaper office going over the accounts of the Krona trial five years ago. Why? You just naturally get curious about someone you've killed. Anyway, I ran across the name of Victor Bruno. Who was Bruno? Didn't you find out? Well, I went to see a friend of mine, court clerk. 
It cost me a bottle of scotch, but I found out something. Now I'm very curious. He didn't remember much about Bruno, only that the cops figured him for the engraving job on those counterfeit bonds. But Bruno never testified at Croner's trial. No, no, I know. They never found him. But, Noah, what do you know about him? No more than you do. <laughs> Funny. Croner didn't look like the type to get away with a million dollars. Neither did Bruno. Oh, you've seen him? Yeah, once, before he disappeared. Croner was out on bail at the time, and Andrew was doing everything he could to help him. He spoke to Bruno, hoping to clear Croner. What did this Bruno look like? Oh, I don't know. Strange little man, always trying to hide. He looked like a, oh, $20 a week bookkeeper. Glasses two inches thick and not a hair in his head. Is he a foreigner? Well, he spoke with an accent. Um, is, is Colby going to be home tonight? As far as I know, why? Oh, maybe I could get him to throw some legal business my way. <laughs> I'll keep him at home for you. Now you better take me back to the office. Well, well, little did I think when I first met Emilio Canepa that you'd be the mother of my children. Why? Is there some connection between the two? No Emilio, no summons. No summons, no children. We'll name our first one Emilio, uh, then. Uh-uh, over my beautiful muscular dead body. Oh, well, back to your office. Hello, Murdoch. Good evening, Mr. Regan. Much killing going on around the place tonight? Mr. Colby is expecting you in the library. Ask a dull question, you get a dull answer. Oh, hello, Bob. Don't be so glad to see me until you find out what I want. I've already told him, Bob. Well, I'm sorry you won't come to Paris. Didn't you tell Mr. Colby about the services our new firm is prepared to offer? I thought I'd better save that for you. Well, we're offering everything in the legal line. Ambulance chasing and grave subpoenas. It sounds like an up-and-coming outfit. We'll sympathize with our clients' troubles and charge only $500 a day for the sympathy. Well, that's cheaper than the sympathy I'm getting from Porter and Griswold. <laughs> Your proposition sounds very attractive. Oh, uh, say, I almost forgot. You know, I think your house is being Watched? Watched? Yeah, some little bald-headed guy, not a hair on his head. He, he just stopped me in front of the lamppost. I don't understand. He spoke with an accent, kept blinking at me through glasses two inches thick. Seemed like he was a $20 a week bookkeeper trying to act important. No, no. Perhaps, Charles. Perhaps. Why did he stop you? Well, he asked me for a light, wanted to know if I was coming in here. Look out the window, Charles. He said something about being a friend of Croner's and that you'd hear from him. He must have gone. There's, there's no one out there now. There isn't any danger, is there? Oh, I don't think so, well, Bob. If you'd like me to talk to if him... If we want Bruno, we can always reach Mr. him. Mr. Colby, if there's any threat, I could no, see him thanks. tonight. Maybe we'll call on you later. I'm much obliged for the information. All right. But uh, seriously, though, about my legal services... I'm sure there will be something for you, Bob. I'll have Porter and Griswold contact you. Oh, thank you. Thanks a lot, Mr. Colby. Good night. Good night, Noel. Good night. Bruno. I wonder what's brought him back. Croner's death, of course, was in all the newspapers. Bruno never impressed me as being the sort of fellow who'd make threats. He was such a meek little man. Did you ever meet him, Noel? Probably. Oh, yes, of course you did. Sometimes I forget how long you've been with me, Noel, how long we've been together. Andrew, if you don't What mind, was it I... you once said about Bruno? That he reminded you of a $20 a week bookkeeper, wasn't it? Do, do you have anything else for me to do this evening? I don't think so. Well, then, then I'll say good night. Good night, Noel. Well, hello. Hey, this could give me a pretty bad name with my landlady. But come in, come on. I'd like to know what you meant by that little performance tonight. Was I convincing? You're not a very nice person, are you? Your high school parking spot came through beautifully. Now, now, wait a minute, Noel. No, you wait. Just what are you up to? What's your guess? Blackmail. <laughs> That's a nice business, too, if you have the right connections. I think I deserve a better answer than that. Sure you do. Noel, there are several people in this town who believe that Croner was deliberately murdered. That's ridiculous. Is it? It would have been comparatively easy for Colby to frame. He invites Croner to the house. In the middle of the conversation, Colby pulls out a gun. He fires one shot into the floor, shoves the gun into Croner's hands, starts wrestling with him and yelling for help. I rush in, Croner turns startled, bang, bang, and it's all over. You must be out of your mind. Why should Andrew want to kill Croner? Suppose, suppose he dreamed up this whole counterfeit deal himself. Well, he promises Croner a share of the profits if he takes the rap 
while Colby takes the million and builds up the business. Krona gets out expecting a share of the gravy. Instead, the lights go out. If I use that kind of reasoning, I could think of at least 50 motives why you killed Krona. The police have 100. Just what were you trying to do tonight? I want to see Bruno. I dreamed up that little man by the street lamp, hoping I could startle Colby into giving me Bruno's address, but fortunately he doesn't startle so easily. How can you be stupid enough to believe all this? Andrew's one of the finest men I've ever known. He's certainly been decent enough to you. Uh, he may have carried his friendship a little too far for my own good. So, you take out the little corn-fed secretary, prime her up with some fake sincerity, and she spills over with everything you want to know. Oh, I know it's not going to be easy to convince you that the things I said today were sincere. It's just about the most hopeless proposition you ever faced. No, look, I'm going to have to make another try for Bruno's address tomorrow. If you give me away, I'll be sunk. In more ways than one. Do what you want. Just don't ask me for any promises. Good night. Well, Charles, where did she go? Straight to Regan's apartment. Yes, I was afraid she had. Why don't you forget about the girl and start thinking about Bruno? She's not easy to forget, Charles. I think a great deal of Noel... It isn't like her to do anything behind my back. Uh, what are you going to do about Bruno? Nothing now. I rather suspect he'll telephone us tomorrow. That'll be plenty of time to decide, Charles. Plenty of time. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. We'll return to Act Three of the Web in just a moment. One of Paramount's loveliest finds of the year is charming, red-haired Lynette Parks, who came from St. Paul to Hollywood by way of the Pasadena Playhouse. Do you find your new life exciting, Lynette? Oh, tremendously, Mr. Keeley. You know, my very first visit to a set was during the filming of Cecil B. DeMille's new picture, Unconquered. An exciting spectacle, indeed. The siege of Fort Pitt by the Indians with flaming arrows and authentic fireballs is really sensational. Modern Pittsburgh, on the site of old Fort Pitt will have a chance to relive its history when the picture has its world premiere there October 3rd. I learned so much from watching the actors, too. No doubt, with Gary Cooper and Paulette Goddard heading such a fine cast of more than 5,000 players. I was especially thrilled when Paulette invited me to her dressing room one day while she was having a costume fitted. And you know the costumes for Unconquered were absolutely authentic for the period. Well, what thrilled me most was the gorgeous negligee Paulette wore between fittings. You know, I used to be afraid washing would fade such pretty things. Before I learned from the studio wardrobe people that Lux Care keeps lingerie lovely so much longer. But John Kennedy knows that. The studios see the practical results of Lux Care, Nanette. I've seen scientific proof. In actual washing tests, slips and nighties washed the Lux way stayed lovely three times as long. Those washed the wrong way soon looked faded and drab. That means girls who give their underthings Lux Care can have three times as many. Without spending any more. How do you figure that, Mr. Kennedy? Well, instead of constantly replacing faded drab under things, you can buy pretty new ones. Because those you luck stay lovely three times as long. So, without spending any more than you would for replacements, you have three times as many pretty things. Thank you for coming tonight, Nanette Parks. We return you to William Keeley. Act Three of The Web, starring Ella Raines as Noel, Edmund O'Brien as Bob Regan, and Vincent Price as Colby. It's been several days since Robert Regan has seen Emilio Canipa, he of the demolished pushcart, but now, shortly after breakfast, the much-involved young lawyer has good reason to call on his client. There's nothing to it, Kanipa. Just phone Colby and tell him exactly what I've told you to say. But you, you sure this ain't illegal? Look, now look, haven't I always been your friend? Sure. Emilio, didn't I graduate from law school? Yeah, sure. Didn't I get you $68.72 for your push card? Not yet. Well, don't be so greedy. 
it hadn't been for your push card, we wouldn't be doing this in the first place. Well, okay, I call up. Had a boy, that's better. Hello? Hello? Oh, uh, yes, this is Mr. Colby. This is Victor Bruno, Colby. Oh, yes, Bruno. I heard you were in town. I wonder if the police are here. I'm in town. All right, Bruno. How much this time? For $10,000, the police don't find out. $10,000? That's a lot of money. I got a lot I could say. Stop by my home tonight. No, 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 no. I don't make the same mistake Crono made. You send the money to me. Where? You know the place. You uh, remember the address? Yes. You sure you remember? Yes, of course. Now, listen, Bruno, I'll give you the money on one condition. Get out of the country, you and your wife. With the money, there'll be two tickets to Mexico City. See that you use them. Just be sure to have the cash there tonight. Nine o'clock. This is the last time, Bruno. Remember that. Well, Charles, what's the matter? You look worried. Uh, If we're going to start paying Bruno, he'll never let us stop. Don't be absurd, Charles. That wasn't Bruno on the phone. Well, then who was it? Not Regan. No, not Regan. Probably a friend of his. How do you know? Instinct, Charles. That's what makes me such an enormous success. But if Bruno was here last Victor night... Victor Bruno has been dead for five years. Dead? Then how did Regan know what he looked like? No. She's the only one who could have given him that description. You never told me Bruno was dead. How did he die? Protesting his innocence. Well, what was Regan after just now? Bruno's whereabouts. Andrew... Did you have Bruno killed? (laughs) Don't be so inquisitive, Charles. I just don't want you to get the idea that what happened to Bruno could happen to me. I'm no coroner and I'm no Bruno. I hope we'll have you here for some time, Charles. Uh, What about Regan? Go to the bank and get $10,000. And then? And then we'll have to do something I'm not going to like doing at all. What about the girl? She's involved in this as much as Regan? Yes, it looks that way. You don't like the idea of getting rid of her, do you? I don't like it at all. But if I have to, I'll do it. I'll arrange for Noel to be here at 8 o'clock. I'm sorry I'm late, Andrew. I had dinner downtown. I found your message when I got home. No, there's something I wish you'd do for me this evening. In the safe there is a large manila envelope with $10,000. Will you get it for me, please? Of course. And then I'd like you to go to the Pennsylvania station and get two tickets for Mexico City. When you've bought the tickets, phone me. I'll tell you then where to deliver the money. Oh, never mind. You can leave the safe open, though. Is this the envelope? Yes. It's for Victor Bruno. You know, it's strange, Noel. Right now, I'm on the verge of getting everything I ever wanted to have. And yet I find there's only one person I can really trust. Andrew, please. I wonder if you know how much I appreciate it. Andrew, that that telephone call from Bruno... It... What about it, now? Oh, nothing. It's not important. I'll see you later. What did he want, Noel? He's paying Bruno off. $10,000 and two tickets to Mexico. Well, you were right, weren't you? Hmm? I'll know for sure after I've seen Bruno. You'll see him. Right after I bought the tickets. Come on. Well, she's on her way, Charles. She's probably met Regan by now. Why do you suppose she did it, Charles? Did she fall in love with him? What difference does it make? For a moment, I thought she was going to tell me. If she had, I would have forgiven her. Well, I, I'd better call the police. Andrew, wait. I'm not so sure this is such a good idea. But why? Well, granted, we can have them picked up for stealing the $10,000 that they find her fingerprints on the safe. That doesn't really get them out of the way. But then, what if they're arrested not merely for theft? What if they're arrested for murder? What? What are you talking about? Whose murder? Your murder, Charles. Yes, this is Lieutenant D'Amico. Mr. Colby. What's that? Where? You sure? Penn Station, huh? Okay. Just sit tight, Mr. Colby. Manhattan 
Limited, leaving on track eight for Philadelphia, Harrisburg. I'd like to make connections for Mexico City, too, please. Leaving tonight, if possible. Mexico City? Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, just a moment, please. Excuse me, miss. You know old Faraday? Why, yes, but... W- Come with me, please. You're under arrest. Arrest? And don't worry about your boyfriend. He's right where you left him. Except there's a cop hanging on a weak arm. Where are you taking me? To Lieutenant D'Amico, miss. He's waiting for us at Mr. Colby's house. We got him all right, Lieutenant. Regan and the girl. Keep him there in the hall. Okay, Doc. Take the body in the library. Bob, look. On the stretcher. Murdoch. Just stay put, Regan. But, but what's happened? Why are they holding us? Mm, because I'm the biggest lunkhead of the year. It never occurred to me Colby'd take it out on you. Andrew? Murdoch's dead. He's gotten rid of the last guy that knew anything about the phony bond deal, and he stuck us with a rap. But he couldn't possibly hope to get away with this. Why would we want to kill Charles? Don't worry. With Colby tailoring the evidence, it'll fit like a bathing suit. Well, a lot of good it does to say it, but I'm sorry, Noel. Bring him in, Johnson. Let's go. Well, laughing boy, I thought I told you not to leave town. Give out to me, go out of the details. Murder and grand theft, and you haven't got a prayer. How does she figure in it? Oh, come on now, Regan. You got the money, Johnson? Here. Yeah. And she was buying two tickets to Mexico City. Okay. Do you mind stepping in here, Mr. Colby? I hope you'll get this over with as quickly as possible. Andrew. Uh, you don't have to talk to her, Mr. Colby. Just identify this envelope. Yes, that's it. I assume the $10,000 is the same. Lieutenant, you understand this is very difficult for me. Miss Faraday has been my confidential secretary for years. Uh, just tell me what happened. Well, I was up in my study doing some work. I heard a shot. I came downstairs and I found Charles dead on the floor. With Regan's gun beside him and the safe was open. My gun? That was his gun. I gave it back to him after... You did? Him. Funny it should have only your fingerprints on it. All right, all right. Maybe mine are on it. When I gave it back to him... I set it on the table. Now, if he had this in mind, he wouldn't have touched it. Not without a glove. Regan, if you were me, would you believe that? If you knew Colby, you would. Who saw you give him back his gun? Miss Faraday, she w- Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Colby. Well, I realized Miss Faraday was the only person besides Charles and myself who knew the combination to the safe. Andrew, you had me open the safe yourself. A couple of nights ago, I happened to overhear a conversation between Mr. Regan and Miss Faraday in which Mexico City was mentioned. And she was buying two tickets to Mexico City when we grabbed her. You already told me that. What are you looking for, a promotion? Lieutenant, he knows why I had the money and he sent me for the ticket. Uh, You'll get your chance to talk, miss. This is very awkward for me, Lieutenant. Well, we're almost finished, Mr. Colby. Why do you believe him, D'Amico? Only yes. That was yesterday. I'm not interested in the Krona case anymore. I got one right here that suits me fine. But this is a frame. You get framed more than any guy I ever met. You're supposed to be a lawyer. Look at the evidence. Lieutenant. Uh, Yeah, yeah, Doc. He's still alive. Murdoch's still alive. Charles. Stay right where you are, Mr. Colby. What are you talking about, Doc? That injection of adrenaline. We won't have him forever, but he may last through the night. Any chance of him coming too? Could be. Let me know the minute he does. Is it all right if we leave him in there, Mr. Colby? Uh, uh, couldn't we move him upstairs? No, no, don't, don't let him near Murdoch. Are He'll... you still running this case? I'm telling you, don't let Colby near Murdoch. You're under arrest, Regan. Now, will you stop telling me my business? Lieutenant Charles has been my closest friend for years. Naturally, I want to go to him. Well, later on, maybe. Right now, I'm waiting here in case he can talk. Maybe we all better wait here. Uh, Mr. Colby, uh, suppose you wait upstairs. Huh? Uh, Gus? Yeah, Lieutenant? Uh, pull up a chair in front of that room where Murdoch is. No visitors. Uh, Johnson, you wait in the front room. And uh, you, Regan, you and her can have this nice big library all to yourselves. And you better start reading up on alibis. Bob, why don't we tell him about Bruno? Mm, How do you think that would sound from the witness stand? I was trying to find a man named Victor Bruno because I was convinced that the other killing I'd done was murder. No... (laughs) Colby figured on that one. If only somebody could find Bruno. Bruno's probably dead, too. Otherwise, how could Colby have been so sure it wasn't Bruno on the phone? (laughs) I suppose so. How could I have been such a dope? You? I've been second-guessing the whole way. You couldn't have put your life in worse hands. 
Listen. Huh? Andrew. His study's just above us. He's worried. He's walking back and forth. He's worried. Lieutenant. Well, he's still alive. Still alive. He's still alive. I thought I... You left the cot in front of the door. Where'd he go? That doc needs some more adrenaline. He sent Johnson to the drugstore. Oh. The Murdoch's not alone in there. The doctor's with him, isn't he? First you shoot him, and then you worry about his health. The doctor's in the kitchen boiling up a hypodermic. Come on, Regan. That's where we're going. You stay where you are, miss. He's alone. Charles is down there alone. Alone. Uh, they'll never know now, Charles, will they? They'll never yeah, know that... bother killing them again, Colby. D'Amico! Murdoch's been dead for two hours, ever since you shot him. Now, how... Watch it, Regan! Turn on the light, Counselor. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, don't just stand there. You knock Colby down, I'll pick him up. Get him out in the hall. Uh, you can come out, Miss Faraday. This you'll want to hear. Bob, what happened? I'm not so sure I know myself. Well, Mr. Colby, tough break, huh? I really solved this one from left field. I've had Regan tail for the last two days. I knew he wasn't here tonight. It's quite a comfort to us taxpayers to find our police department in such competent hands. Thanks. Thanks so much. Oh, uh, just to keep the record straight, whatever happened to Kroner's million dollars? That's strange. That's what Kroner wanted to know. Yeah, very funny. Come on, Johnson. We're taking Colby downtown. Oh, that D'Amico. He's really the answer to a maiden's prayer. Yeah, he's a smart cookie, but he doesn't catch everything. What's that? Something D'Amico forgot to take. Two tickets to Mexico City. Think we can use them? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've, um, always wanted to try out my Spanish. Hey, don't forget, you two. You'll have to check with my department if you're figuring on living the country. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, D'Amico. That Colby still owes my client $68.72. Well, you're a lawyer. Sue him. <laughs> Our stars will return for their curtain calls in a moment. Libby, do you realize what a big job American housewives do just getting together meals for their families? That's true, Mr. Kennedy. The average housewife plans, buys, carries home, cooks and serves well over 1,000 meals a year. And in most cases, she washes the dishes for all those meals, too. An average of six tons a year. And yet her husband and children expect her to keep her hands lovely. Well, smart housewives have found out how to do that, in spite of dishwashing, Libby. Of course, with Lux Flakes. For dishes, for any soap and water job around the house. Right. That's why a Lux lady doesn't have red, rough dishpan hands. Well, naturally. Some women try other types of soaps at one time or another, but they soon get wise. What strong suds can do to hands is a caution. And red, rough hands are no prize at a bridge game. Discouraging to friend husband, too. So, John, it's no wonder thousands of housewives stick to Lux for dishes. They're so right, because hundreds of scientific tests have actually proved how much kinder Lux is to hands. When strong soaps made women's hands rough and red, changing to Lux improved them in two to seven days. Soon the skin was just as soft and smooth as ever. And Lux is so thrifty, too. Lux flakes make such rich suds, they actually go further, much further. They don't die away like some suds. So, ladies, why not try Lux for your dishes? Here's Mr. Keeley at the microphone. For an exciting performance of a thrilling drama, our thanks to Ella Raines, Edmund O'Brien, and Vincent Price, who take the spotlight for a curtain call.
Ella, now that you and Edmund have solved the mystery of the moment, I wonder if, uh, in an altogether different vein, you'd help our audience solve the burning question of the season. I'll do my best. What is it, Bill? As one of Hollywood's most photographed and best-dressed stars, where do you stand in the current fashion battle between long and short skirts? Well, I, I see that Ella takes a stand in short skirts for tonight's appearance. Well, that's because I happen to be wearing a suit. Now, does that follow? Look at my suit. <laughs> Still just below the ankle. <laughs> but for women's suits, I feel the shorter length is smarter. For dresses, I prefer the current longer length. How do you feel about the question, Ed? Oh, I feel that women shouldn't be a slave to fashion, but ought to follow what looks attractive. You agree, Vince? Sure, I follow anything that looks attractive. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, when it comes to shorter skirts, I believe the eyes have it. <laughs> you mean the masculine eyes, of course. <laughs> How about you, Vince? Are you a member of that um, little below-the-knee club? Well, it depends how little is below the knee. Uh-huh. <laughs> De gustibus non disputandum. Did I say something I shouldn't? <laughs> <laughs> no, Vince. Ella means there's no disputing tastes. But there's no question of divided taste in what we're offering on this stage next Monday night. I understand it's something very special, Bill. Yes, one of the screen's most brilliant feminine stars, whose rare appearances in radio are always an event. Plus, one of Hollywood's outstanding male stars in his first screen role since he left the Navy Air Corps. Catherine Hepburn and Robert Taylor. I guess you need say no more, Bill. <laughs> no, indeed. Catherine and Bob appear in Metro Golden Mayor's thrilling drama, Undercurrent, repeating their original screen roles of a man and woman whose love is overshadowed by a haunting figure from the past. Well, it ought to be standing room only Monday night. Congratulations and good night. Good, good night. night to all of you and thanks. <laughs> Viva Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Catherine Hepburn and Robert Taylor in Undercurrent. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Again, a word of appreciation to the housewives of America for the swell job you're doing saving and turning in used fats and oils. The world shortage of fats is still very much with us, and industry needs every drop of used fat just as much as ever. So now that the weather is cooler and you're doing more cooking, keep a tin handy for used fat. Remember, your dealer will pay you well for every pound you turn in. Ella Raines will next be seen in Nunnally Johnson's The Senator Was Indiscreet. Edmund O'Brien will soon be seen in the Canaan production, A Double Life. Vincent Price's next Universal International picture will be Up in Central Park. Heard in our cast tonight were Maria Palmer as Martha, Bill Johnstone as D'Amico, Robert Griffin as Murdoch, and Norman Field, Jay Novello, Edwin Cooper, Cliff Clark, and Eddie Marr. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is rebroadcast to our servicemen and women overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear Undercurrent with Katherine Hepburn and Robert Taylor. It's spry for pastry so tender, flaky, nut sweet, any pie filling tastes more delicious. You'll say pastry is extra delicate, better tasting with spry. Be sure to listen next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Undercurrent with Catherine Hepburn and Robert Taylor. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>